Welcome back to our lecture series. Just this, and then two more lectures after this, and you all receive your degree. Hey! All right. We want to now. Somebody suggested that after all this, all this patience you've had and all the listening, we should start offering continuing education units. So we'll see what we can do. Maybe an extra. Um, today we're going to be talking about culture, uh, history, culture, and conflict in the Middle East. As I said earlier, this is going to be the most subjective of all my lectures. What I mean by that is I am going to try to give you a, a terribly oversimplified understanding of why there continues to be conflict in the Middle East, why after almost 70 years we seem unable to make much progress in terms of gaining peace overall. Um, and once I give you kind of an understanding of that, hopefully an understanding of that, then I'm going to give you some of my ideas about where we go. So it is entirely subjective. I will tell you in advance, I give you full permission to disagree with me without yelling at me. <laughs> because when I've done this talk twice before, I've had people very strongly on one side of some of the issues, and then I've done it again later, and I've had people very strongly on the other side. Um, and so you're free to agree, disagree, whatever you would like, but hopefully we'll come away with it at least with a little more understanding. Um, tomorrow, today, history, culture, and conflict in the Middle East. Tomorrow morning, Alexander the Great and Hellenism, why so much of the world is based upon Greek culture, thanks to Alex, uh, Big Al, as I call him. And then tomorrow afternoon, uh, Greece, the birthplace of Western civilization, we'll discuss why Greece was so important and how unlikely it was actually that Greece would be um, what they became. To get us started today um, with the discussion on history, culture, and conflict, I want to give you a chart. And this, I think, will help you understand what goes on in the Middle East. This chart is produced by the Institute of Internet Diagrams. And um, I want to read you just a paragraph that accompanied this to give you some idea. Uh, it said, while it's common to hear people describe the Middle East as a complex and obscure place, the diagram plainly illustrates that this is not the case. The relationships follow logical patterns reflecting geopolitical interests, partnerships, and conflicts. For example, the United States is evidently on friendly terms with Iran at least in Iraq. But America is on the opposite side of the conflict in Yemen. In Syria, the US and Iran are both against and with each other, depending on the outcome of the nuclear talks. I especially like that this chart over in the right-hand corner, it says, note, Palestine and Israel were discounted for the sake of simplicity. <laughs> this doesn't even address the issue of, Palestine, of the Palestinian conflict, OK? Now, we can make light of it um, because it is so complicated, but I'm going to try to simplify it a little bit for you. I think that the, the easiest way, and this is a gross oversimplification, but a way for us to try to get a handle on it is to think in terms of the, there three, being three major <coughs> arenas or areas of conflict in the Middle East. And, and these are closely interwoven, but I want you to think about it in three ways. First, there is uh, the conflict between the Islamic Middle Eastern people and countries and the West. And by the West, I mean Western Europe, United States, not Canada. Who has a problem with Canada? Uh, but the Western Europe and the United States and the conflict that is inherent, and why is that between them and the Islamic Middle East? There's not nearly as much conflict between the United States, say, in Indonesia, which is the largest Islamic country in the world. There is something particular about this region. So that's one arena of conflict that we're going to talk about. Secondly, the conflict between religious and political factions within Islam. In the Middle East, that would be Shia versus Sunni, Salafi, which is a very conservative Sunni, versus, or Shia Islamists. The word Islamist, the, uh, or Islamism, means those who take a very radical approach to it. Okay. The Islamists versus moderates. And then Sunni Sudan versus Shia Iran, etc., etc. All of the conflicts that exist within the Islamic world, particularly in the Middle East, much more so in the Middle East than elsewhere. Um, this would include, for instance, the problem with ISIL. Because ISIL's primary target is not the West, although you know they are anti-Israel and therefore anti the people that support them. Their primary concern is trying to conquer Syria and Iraq the Levant, and whatever other countries they can, the vast majority of which is Islamic. The countries that are fighting against them most actively, while the United States has done some you know, aerial bombardment, that sort of thing, most of the countries that are fighting them are Syria, Iraq, Jordan. 
So they are Islamic peoples fighting one another. So those conflicts exist. And then the third area of, or arena of conflict in the Middle East is between Israel and their many neighboring Middle Eastern countries, and especially over the issues related to the Palestinian question. Uh, so all of these, however, are interwoven. For instance, the U.S.'s support for Israel creates conflict between us and some countries. The fact that the United States went to war in Afghanistan and Iraq creates conflict. These things are, are very much interwoven. But I want to start out by giving you, with, with this as kind of a, an overview of where we're going, looking at these issues, I want to start out giving you a historical context which might help us understand. In the late 700s to the 1200s, a period of almost 500 years, Islam went through a period which has been called the Golden Age, Islamic Golden Age. From the, uh, up until the sack of Baghdad by the Mongols in the mid-1200s, uh, it was an attempt by the Islamic world to gather all knowledge and to translate all knowledge into Arabic and to capture it. As a result of that, the Arab world, the Islamic Arabic world, were responsible for preserving and maintaining a lot of the ancient wisdom. The Greek philosophers, Socrates, Aristotle, the ancient math mathematics, uh, the work of um, Hippocrates, the founder of modern medicine, and Galen, all of this stuff was gathered by Islamic scholarship during the Islamic age. In fact, the Quran says that the ink of a scholar is more holy than the blood of a martyr. Islam has always valued that kind of scholarship. They established intellectual centers throughout the Islamic world that focused on science, philosophy, medicine, art, education. In Baghdad, Cairo, Cordoba, in the, uh, the, the Moorish lands in the Iberian Peninsula, the government at that time, the Islamic government, uh, subsidized, patronized the, and a pos that's the positive use of that word, patronized, scholars to a great extent. In fact, the very best translators, the very best scholars in ancient Islamic times were paid the equivalent of the kinds of salaries that modern athletes get. They were wealthy. The government subsidized them to extreme levels because of what they contributed. There was a time there uh, when they created easier methods of writing and the introduction of paper. Paper had been invented in China, but it came into the Arabic world and they really maximized it. In fact, they created factories where they were uh, hand, there wasn't printing of course yet, they were handwriting documents and they produced more documents than had ever been available before. In fact, it was the first time in history where it was possible to make a living as a writer or as a bookseller. Now, all of this is still hand copy, but there was an enormous growth in education. They had schools, libraries, translation centers. In fact, the first universities in history were Islamic universities. The first degree offering school ever was in the Islamic Arab world. They, um, as I say, they gathered the philosophy of the ancients and they developed it. Um, and at that time, too, there was a real flourishing of non-Muslims. This was not limited to just Muslim peoples. In fact, the, the Nestorian Christians, it was a particular sect of Christianity that existed in the Far East, Nestorian Christians were especially involved as, as doctors, as uh, scientists, as philosophers. There was, there was a significant emphasis on Jewish philosophy. In fact, this is the period of time in the uh, Al-Andalus, the Islamic area of Spain, where uh, Maimonides um, uh, was, was working as a philosopher, one of the greatest of all Jewish scholars. Uh, scientifically, they invented, although you, you'll read something else in your textbooks, they invented the scientific method as we understand it today, the idea of experimentation and observation. They classified minerals and elements, the European way of doing it in medieval times, was everything was either related to air, fire, earth, um, you know, that sort of thing. They actually analyzed different kinds of minerals and broke them up into things like salts and uh, boraxes and various other kind of scientific things. Um, the first true scientist was an Arabic man named Alhazen. Mathematics, they developed uh, calculus, geometry. In fact, the geometries that was developed in medieval times in the Islamic world were later in the 20th century confirmed to be an exact representation <coughs> of, of the quasi-crystal structures at the subatomic level. Trigonometry, 
physics, biology, medicine. In fact, they not only captured all of the, the Greek and Latin medical knowledge, they created the world's first hospitals. In fact, they had 24-hour hospitals in all the major cities. The hospitals were free of charge. No one had to pay for medical care. In fact, I want to read you a quote. Uh, this is, there was a hospital in the Fat that was made out of an old Fatima palace in Cairo, and it served 4,000 people a day. It, in fact, it had beds for 4,000 people. They had different wards for different illnesses. They even had a mental hospital. And they said this about their hospital. These were the rules. The hospital shall keep all patients, men and women, until they are completely recovered. All costs are to be borne by the hospital, whether the people come from afar or near, whether they are residents or foreigners, strong or weak, low or high, rich or poor, employed or unemployed, blind or sighted, physically or mentally ill, learned or illiterate. There are no conditions of consideration for payment. None is objected to or even indirectly hinted at for non-payment. How advanced can you be? Um, the, it's the first time in history that they required that doctors receive diplomas of training for medical care. Not just anybody could practice medicine. And this is the time when the primary doctors in Europe were, were barbers. You know, hair, people who cut hair also cut off legs. Um, so astonishing the, the advances that came during this time. The, uh, the golden age of Islam. They also advanced in the arts. They uh, did ceramics, glass, metalwork, textiles, woodwork, illuminated manuscripts, and calligraphy. You've seen some of the beautiful Arabic writing. Uh, they developed extraordinary architectural uh, feats. So this was the time when the Islamic world was the center of all civilization, of all knowledge, of all learning. In Baghdad, in the 800s, they created a place called the House of Wisdom. And at one time, it was the world's largest repository of books. And that was the place they, that, because it was in Baghdad, which was the center of one of the great dynasties at that point, that they wanted to capture all of human learning and translate it into Arabic. And then from Arabic, it got translated into Turkish and Hebrew and later Latin and many other different languages. They had um, astronomy observatories, an extraordinary time. So the question comes, what happened? Given the fact that between the 8th century and the 12th, early 13th century, the Islamic world was the most advanced, the best educated, the most artistic, the most scientific, the most advanced in medicine in every other category you can imagine, when Europeans were still struggling and illiterate. What happened? How did the Islamic Arabic peoples lose their edge over the West? The interesting thing is, while we can say what happened, how did is the Islamic world lose their advanced edge, over many centuries that question has been converted in the minds of the, uh, the Islamic people, especially young people. Who did this to us? Who caused us to lose all that we had during the Golden Age? There's a book that I would recommend to you with, with caution by Rodney Stark. Rodney Stark has written a number of excellent books. He's got one called How the West Won. And he talks about why Islam went from being so extraordinary to being behind in almost every category imaginable. I disagree with some of his conclusions. For instance, he said the reason was because it wasn't, you know, there weren't Arabs that were doing all the good work anyway. It was Nestorian Christians and Persians and uh, Jewish people. That's not... I don't completely agree with that, having studied other histories. And the fact is that all of this was being encouraged and paid for and, and uh, really promulgated by the Arabic Islamic authorities, the people who, you know, in government who were in charge. I think there's several reasons why, my own perception and my own evaluation, why the Islamic world fell behind after being so far ahead. The first one was pride. They were so convinced that they were so far advanced that the non-Islamic world, they perceived, have it, had nothing to offer them. In fact, the Islamic world, during all those centuries of the Golden Age, they made no effort to send representatives to other parts of the world. Um, others would come there. In fact, most of the European countries, once they started advancing, like um, England and Germany and France, they would send delegations who would come and live in the Islamic countries and learn from them. They would send their scientists to learn. The Islamic 
golden age, they didn't send anybody to these other places because they, they thought they're so backward they don't have anything to offer us. And over a period of time, everyone else was learning from them and taking, taking the good stuff from them. They were not gaining anything back. And so they stagnated. Related to that, they uh, depended upon tradition. They thought they were so advanced, and this is related to the pride thing, that they established their traditions. They, for instance, held that the Quran, and interestingly enough, Aristotle, were the two great authorities they looked to. The Quran for religious things, Aristotle for the, the theory of the mind. As other ideas began to develop and that sort of thing, they made no effort to advance beyond that. They, they were stuck where they were. And some of it was related to a misguided religious fervor. There was a sense amongst the Islamic world that if we send people, for instance, if we send delegations to go and live in Paris or any of the other places that started growing as cities and became centers of learning, etc., if we send people to live there, then they'll get polluted by these non-Islamic people, and we wouldn't, we wouldn't cause our people to have to go through that. And so there was this misguided religious fervor. It came to a point after a while that there was so much emphasis on Quran study, and this is true today. Children in many, uh, many of the less developed parts of the Islamic world, they, their whole education is oriented around learning the Quran. By the time they are you know, adolescents, young adults, many of them have memorized the entire Quran. And they spend all of their education focusing on understanding it, learning what it means, how to apply it. They don't study the three R's. They don't learn mathematics. They don't learn other things because they've gotten so focused on the religious orientation, they have discounted and discarded many of the other things that they need. But still, in the modern world, I think the question comes up to, to and has for centuries now, who is responsible for causing us to lose our advantage? Who did this to us? That's human nature. That's not something we can put on them because of a cultural difference. You know, Westerners do the same thing. We're always looking. Human nature is you always don't blame somebody else for your problems. You never accept responsibility for it. None of us want to. Um, Self-justification is one of the most powerful of all human motivations. Carolyn's smiling because she's heard me say that so many times. I used to have a large staff of people when I was uh, vice president of an advertising agency, and I used to have to tell them when they worked with clients, and they said, how can they, you know, this client's being crazy. And I said, well, self-justification is a powerful motivator. You have to be wrong because they can't be wrong. <laughs> well, we do that all the time. And the Islamic world did that for several centuries, and we still see that today. Well, you add to that sort of insecurity about who did this to us, from this great advanced civilization to where they are today, and then you add some of the things that the West really has done to them. We talked about the fact that, um, when we talked about Lawrence of Arabia, that the West made all kinds of promises to the Arab world prior to the First World War. All the things they were going to do for them. The uh, McMahon-Hussein correspondence in which the British government promised that they would help create an Arab nation now, there's, somebody pointed out to me, there were a few exceptions. There was an area up here that, that in the McMahon um, correspondence, they said, we can't guarantee this, these sections. These may not be included. But for the most part, all the rest of this will become part of one Arab nation. They promised. And then at the same time, within three months of that, the British are involved in signing the, the Sykes-Picot Agreement, in which they blatantly gave away the land that they had promised to the Arabs. So it went from being this to being this, where all of the best of the lands were split up in mandates, as they were called, between the French and the British. And then, when, even when they left, they decided where the national lines were. They decided where the country boundaries were, without regard for any ethnic differences, without regard for tribal differences, um, or any of the other issues that are so critical to the people in this part of the world. So they fed the conflicts in a great many ways. To the extent that today, as I've talked about before, I'm bringing this up because all of this feeds into this issue of where's the conflict come from? Why can't we resolve it? These are some of the deepest seated feelings against the West. The Sykes-Picot Agreement and the San Remo Conference in which the League of Nations confirmed the Sykes-Picot Agreement they are considered the turning points in the relationship between the West and this part of the world. Western Asia, the Middle East. Uh, today they are still referring to these things as the great deceits. This is a picture of Erdogan, the 
um, uh, Erdogan, excuse me, Erdogan, I keep getting his name backwards, Erdogan, who is the president of Turkey, and giving a speech, he said Lawrence of Arabia, because he was blaming Lawrence of Arabia for this Sykes-Picot and for the betrayal of the Arab peoples, and Lawrence of Arabia was completely against this. He's, he's making a convenient sort of twist of the actual history, that he was a bigger enemy than ISIS to the Middle East. The Imperial West persisted and continued up into, uh, continues up till modern time. I mean, we can't deny that historically, to try to dictate issues of national boundaries. That's continued well into the 20th century. Erdogan was quoted when he made this speech as saying, each conflict in this region has been designed a century ago. And he means First World War. And he says, it is our duty to stop this. He is voicing something that a lot of people in this part of the world think. That a lot of their problems are because of what the West has done to them down through history. And especially following the First World War. We then have what many people in the Middle East would consider the second great betrayal following the World War I, which is the Balfour Agreement, in which the British government, after promising that the Arabs would have, to have this as a nation, they, uh, claim, they voiced the opinion that they would support the foundation of a Jewish homeland in Palestine, right in the middle of where it was promised to the Arab peoples. Now, um, I'm going to get into that in, in a little bit. The, now, the reaction of the Jewish people, that I saw a headline just the other day, the centuries-long conflict between Arabs and Jews. That's not true. Arabs and Jews have not been fighting each other for centuries. In fact, um, after the declaration of the Balfour Agreement in November of 1918, a large group of Palestinian leaders, authorities in the region, got together and issued a, an, a, a statement. And they said, and I'm quoting here, and this, they issued the statement to British authorities. They said, we have always sympathized profoundly with the persecuted Jews and their misfortunes in other countries. But there is a wide difference between such sympathy and the acceptance of such a nation ruling over us and disposing of our affairs. I don't think that's an unfair thing to say, do you? Beyond that, the Arab leadership continued early on to respond positively to the establishment of a Jewish population. Not a homeland as a separate country necessarily, but a population. When Hussein bin Ali, the king of the Hejaz, the one to whom the promise had been made for the new territory of the Arab nation, he said that they would openly accept Jewish immigration and that he understood their need for a place to flee from persecution. This is in 1920. His son, King Faisal, who became for a short time the king of Syria before the French threw him out, against everyone's wishes, and then later became the king of Iraq, said this, we Arabs look with deepest sympathy on the Zionist movement. Our deputation here in Paris, this was during the Paris Peace Conference after the First World War, our deputation here in Paris is fully acquainted with the proposals submitted yesterday by the Zionist organization to the Peace Conference, and we regard them as moderate and proper. We will do our best insofar as we are concerned to help them through. We will wish the Jews a most hearty welcome home. I look forward, and my people with me look forward, to a future in which we will help you, and you will help us, so that the countries in which we are mutually interested may once again take their places in the community of the civilized people of the world. That was King Faisal in 1920. He was per almost certainly the most influential and important leader in the Arab world at the time. And that's what he had to say. This was a public statement. Historically, there has not been a centuries-long conflict between Arabs and Jews. The only real anti-Semitism that occurred prior to very recent times came out of Europe, not out of the Middle East. And yet, we get that wrong. In 1947, there had been a large migration of Jewish people into the British mandate. In fact, the British couldn't wait to be rid of this because they couldn't figure out how to control the immigration. They had um, Jewish guerrilla organizations, the Yergun and the Haganah, fighting against them to try to keep them from, from preventing more immigration of Jewish people. The Arabs were mad because the Jews were... The British said, this is a losing proposition for us. They could not wait to get out of there. 
Well, when they finally reached the end of the time of the British mandate, the, the contractual agreement, in 1947, the United Nations proposed a two-state partition in Palestine. When they made that proposal, and this is what they look, this, on the left is what it looks like. The blue areas were the proposed Jewish states. The brown areas were the proposed Palestinian states for the, the Palestinian Arabic peoples who were living there. And the red area around Jerusalem was to be a UN managed sort of neutral area that everybody had access to. Because both the Jews and the Palestinians, remember the, the Dome of the Rock is on the Temple Mount, one of the holiest places to all Muslim peoples. So they were gonna manage that as a separate thing. Israel accepted that proposal. They said, fine, we will accept that. That was not acceptable to the Palestinians who were living here or to the Arab, their Arab neighbors. So in June, of, because they felt it was a violation of everything they'd been promised. So in June of 1948, the Arab states of Egypt, Jordan, Iraq, and Syria invaded Israel. They invaded from every direction, from the north, from the east, from the south. And initially, this they pushed the, uh, the Jewish military forces. They didn't have a formal army at that point, but they did have militia that had been formed over many, many years. They pushed them back into a much more limited area. Now, what had happened at that time is the, and I, by the way, I, I'm very fair. There's probably no one more sympathetic to the plight of the persecuted Jewish people over history. There has never been a more persecuted people than the Jews. Their desire, their, their need for a secure homeland is unquestioned. But at the same time, we have to be fair that even given that reality, not everything that Israel has done has been the best, you know, or noble or honorable, I don't think. Again, just like the Crusades, there's no good guy and bad guy. You can't just draw a line and say everything on this side is right and everything on that side is wrong. Whenever I've done this talk, as I said, it varies. I'll get a group of people who are ready to have me, you know, thrown overboard because they, they want one side. The last time I did this talk, I had a group of people who talked to me, who thought they could convince me that Israel was completely in the wrong and there was no way I could justify anything about that. I really do see both sides of it. Well, after pushing them back here, the Israeli, um, the militia, guerrilla organizations, they really were guerrilla organizations, had been um, actively trying to push some Palestinians out of areas that they thought that they were going to get control of. And then, this, while that was all going on, the five countries that invaded, the Arab countries that invaded, sent word to the Palestinians living in certain areas and said, okay, this isn't going to take us long to beat these, the, the Israelis, they weren't called it then, the Jewish people. So you need to get out of the way. Leave your homes, get out of the way. We will come in, it'll matter of a few days, at most a couple weeks, we will win this war because we have five different armies coming in at them. We will win and then you can come back home. Well, in very short order, the next month after this is what happened in June of 1948, Israel counterattacked and they pushed those armies completely out and they ended up having control over much more land than was originally supposed to be, according to the UN, what they were going to have as the nation of Israel, all right? So that, all that they had all of this area, this area which is called the West Bank because it's the West Bank of the Jordan River. I think some people were a little confused because we were in, when we were in Luxor, they kept talking about the West Bank. And you hear West Bank and you think, well, isn't this the West Bank? Well, they're talking about the West Bank of the Nile. This is the West Bank of the Jordan. This is what used to be called Transjordan, because it, Transjordan means on the other side of the Jordan. It became the country of Jordan. And so there was a strip here, known as the Gaza Strip. There was an area of the West Bank uh, along here. This is how far the armies, the military of the, uh, the Jewish people pushed the Arabs back to the people, the Palestinian people today, especially those who left their homes, there are people from 1948 until today, they are still living in refugee camps. Some of them still have the keys to their houses that they left in 1948. And they, they're unwilling to give up and leave, many of them, because to do so would be to give up what they feel is the rights to their property. Now, it's not the same people, it's their children and their children's children. But they still hold out the hope that someday they'll be able to go back to their original homeland. Um, the Palestinian people call this time the Nakba which means the catastrophe. The, 
in total, there are about 800,000 Palestinian refugees, people that have been displaced from their original homes. Many of those have settled in Jordan or other places, but one of the great misfortunes is that the other Arab countries have not been accepting of them. Jordan has been best at it. In Lebanon, they are forced to live in refugee camps to this day. They are not, there are 72 different areas of employment that a Palestinian refugee in Lebanon is legally forbidden to pursue. They can't be doctors or engineers or lawyers or you name it. They cannot take advantage of the government health care. They cannot become a citizen. That's true in Saudi Arabia. In fact, Saudi Arabia, um, in, 90, in 2004, they passed a new law making it easier for foreigners living in their country to become citizens. But Palestinians were not included in that. They specifically were accepted from that. And someone who is an, uh, a citizen of Saudi Arabia who marries a Palestinian, the Palestinian still can't become a citizen. So the Arab countries have not been helpful in terms of helping deal with this issue. So many of them still are refugees. This is the changes between 1949, after the 48 War, the War of Independence, and the modern times, the, the, uh, the, the war in 1967-68. And this was what the 49 Armistice Line was. This line here, which gave Israel access to Jerusalem. Jordan, at that point, controlled this area we know as the West Bank. The Gaza Strip was controlled by Egypt. And that continued that way from 1949 to 1967. Well, in 67, there's another war. And Israel occupies all of this area, area, the Gaza Strip. In fact, they occupy the whole Sinai Peninsula. And it was, was not given back to them until the Camp David Peace Accords, where uh, President Jimmy Carter negotiated between Anwar Sadat and Malcolm Begin the return of Sinai in return for a pledge from Egypt to recognize the right of Israel to exist and to not pursue any additional military. They still have some restrictions. For instance, in the Sinai, there's a limit to how many military soldiers can be present in the Sinai from Egypt. Because Israel's saying, we don't want you to have a big buildup of military in the Sinai because, you know, that's, that's the border we have with you. And so, at that point, Israel has occupied the West Bank, all of Sinai, and the Golan Heights because there's an area of, of Syria right at the Sea of Galilee that's elevated. And so they were having problems with artillery and rockets and things coming out of the Golan Heights into some of the kibbutzim, you know, the communities that were below there. And so they conquered that as well. In this area of the Palestinian um, West Bank, there are now, as of the Oslo Peace Accords, there are three different kinds of territories that now have been divided up. There are the, the dark green here are the Palestinian civil and security. The Palestinians completely control those areas, and that's the area where the most Palestinians live. The lighter green area is under Palestinian civil control, but it's shared Israeli-Palestinian security. So the Israelis have some security forces there. And then the brown areas are under the control still of Israel. But there's very few people living there. I mean, there's almost nothing uh, happening there. There are various areas that are identified as the Palestinian uh, zones. Jerusalem, Janine, Nablus, um, Tolkarm, Ramallah, Jericho, Bethlehem, and, and Hebron. If you have tried to go to, let's say, Bethlehem in recent years, you have to go through checkpoints. It is in the Palestinian territories. Now, 120 plus countries have recognized Palestine as an independent nation. A, a number of very significant countries haven't, like the United States. We still consider it, we call it the Palestinian territories in the US, because we consider it occupied territory. And so there's a question is even what does it constitute? Is it a nation? Is it a country? Uh, is it owned by Israel? Is it occupied territory? There's still questions about all of that. And there's very strong feelings about Israel's role. In fact, just today in the Times Digest, there's an article called Views on Israel Drive a Wedge in Campus Life. It's about the fact that a movement that started in Europe and it's come to the United States, the BDS movement, BDS stands for Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions Campaign against Israel for what is believed by many people to be um, atrocities, if it, it, uh, many people would say that's the word, or at least oppression of the Palestinian people. Um, This is another map of where we stand today. The lighter yellow is Israel. 
This is the Gaza Strip. This is the West Bank. Jerusalem is right here. Jerusalem, technically, East Jerusalem, where the old city is, is part of the Palestinian territories. But Israel maintains full access to that. Jordan had controlled it for a long time. They gave up control of it. Um, and so Israel has technically control of the West Bank. In 2005, Israel made a unilateral withdrawal from the Gaza Strip down here. For a long time, the Gaza Strip and the West Bank were both considered one un unit, an entity. They were both controlled by the Palestinian Authority, which was the party was called Fatah. But then, in 2007, it, um, Hamas, another much more radical organization, won a majority of seats in the Palestinian representational body, and they threw Fatah out of Gaza. So one of the additional problems now is you've got Fatah, one organization, who is the government controlling, under Israel's authority, the West Bank, and Hamas, a much more radical militant organization, who has as part of their charter the destruction of the nation of Israel. They have that written into their charter, and that's why Gaza, they've had all these incidents of them firing missiles into Israel. Israel has completely closed off the border. They've completely closed off the coastline. Um, this is one of the things that people are having the most problem with Israel about in this whole situation, is that the Gaza Strip right now has one of the lowest standards of living in the world. The people there live on less than $10 a day. There is 70% of the people in the Gaza Strip live below the international standard for poverty. And they, they don't have any trade because they're not allowed to cross the border. They, can't, they, they don't have any trade. In Egypt, there is also a crossing into Egypt. But Egypt doesn't let anybody come out because they've had some problems in the Sinai Peninsula with Islamic extremists causing problems. They're afraid if some of the extremists from Hamas in the Gaza Strip come into Egypt, they will foment problems there. And so Egypt on the south, Israel, both at sea and around the border, have almost completely enclosed this area. And not only that, it's 139 square miles, the Gaza Strip. There are just under 2 million people living in 139 square miles. They're, it's one of the most overcrowded places on the planet. And because there's no money, they don't have any materials to buy new housing. And so there are a lot of homeless people because they can't build housing. And yet, Israel has closed it off because they say, you know, we, we left in 2005 and the response to that was shooting rockets across into Israel. How are they supposed to deal with that? Um, The typical way that they've talked about Israel and Palestine resolving their issues are there have been two t standard solutions. One is called the one state solution. That all of these areas, and, and by the way, these are just enlargements of the West Bank and of the Gaza Strip. The, the Gaza Strip's about, um, it's 25 miles long and between three and a half and seven and a half miles wide. So it's 139 square miles. The, the issue is, the one state proposal, is that they find a way for the West Bank and Gaza to be incorporated into the nation of Israel, whether they call it Palestine or Israel or whatever else, and they become one country. The other option is the two country or two state solution, where the Palestinian areas become one nation and Israel's another nation. Well, the, Israel will not and cannot agree to a one state solution. One state solution would, would mean that they everybody has a vote. Everybody's a citizen, Palestinian or, or Israeli. They have a vote. They can vote their government. The difficulty is that right now there is a much larger population in the West Bank and Gaza than there is in all the rest of Israel. The Arab Islamic population already exceeds the population of the Jewish, uh, the Jewish population in Israel, which means if they gave everybody a vote, Israel would immediately be voted out of existence. And it's getting that's that's not going to get better because there is a much higher birth rate in the Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip has the third they're already overcrowded and they have the 13th highest birth rate in the world. And so the Gaza Strip and the West Bank not only have more people in them already, but their population is growing much faster. They talk about the prime ministers in Israel talk about facing a population bomb. Israel has a desperate need, which has been historically verified, to have a Jewish homeland in which they can be secure. They have been persecuted, not only in the Holocaust in Europe, but through the pogroms in Russia, thrown out of Spain, and on and on and on. This is the first time since 
ancient Israel that they have a homeland that they can be secure in. They are not going to throw that away by having one person, one vote, because they would no longer have a Jewish homeland. This problem with this two-state solution is um, just how do you set that up? The Palestinians continue to maintain, many of them, not all, and in fact, um, Yasser Arafat, who was the head of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, who, who was initially informally and later formally recognized as the head of the Palestinian people, he was um, a terrorist by his own admission for a long time. Later on, as he got older, he agreed on the right of Israel to exist. He pledged nonviolence that they would not pursue violence. Um, and people felt if he'd lived longer, he might have helped make this happen. And yet, there continue to be a significant portion of the Palestinians, the hard feelings that exist against the, uh, the Israelis for having taken their homes, you know, they feel, that's how they understand it. And the fact that Israel continues to create hard feelings in a couple of ways. One, they have built a fence called the security boundary. Um, I'll get to that in a second. A security boundary has a lot of names. The people most critical of it called the apartheid fence that surrounds the Palestinian areas. In some places, it's 26 feet tall of concrete. If you go to Israel, if you drive through anywhere, you can usually see it. It stands out. And they have done that because there have been two periods of time called the um, um, intifadas, where there was a, a violent upheaval, not only protests, but terrorist acts and bombings and that sort of thing by Palestinians against Israel. Israel, in order they felt to protect themselves, built this security, uh, built and is continuing to build a security fence. Well, as I heard a fellow who was uh, talking about the needs of the Palestinian people at one time, he said that during the Troubles, as they call them in, in Ireland, if Great Britain had solved the problem of there being a, a relatively few people in Belfast who were terrorists, if they'd solved that problem by building a 26-foot tall wall around Belfast, would the Western world have said that was okay? Almost certainly not. The, the security barrier separates family members because some are not allowed to live on the Israeli side. They're they only allowed, for security reasons they believe, to stay on the Palestinian side, and they can only visit on weekends uh, on the Palestinian side. It separates farmers from their land. It separates peoples from their jobs previously. It separates com communities from their water sources. No matter how sympathetic we may want to be to the efforts to try to prevent terrorist acts, you can imagine how people feel when they're told we're building this wall and you can no longer get to the land that you own on the other side of that wall or to the water sources that you depend on or to the job you used to have. It's a, it's a very difficult thing. In addition to that, this is the Palestinian territory of the West Bank. The people of Israel have continued to come in and build settlements, they're called, in the Palestinian area, Jewish settlements in the Palestinian area. And the government of Israel has allowed that. Everyone, no matter how supported, no matter how much of an ally they've been to Israel, like the United States, for instance, have been critical of this. Because every community that gets built like that, and often it's, you know, they're pushing the Palestinians back and away, that creates further hard feelings. You know, you've said we have this Palestinian territory, 120 countries have recognized us as an independent nation, and yet we don't have an army, and you do, and so you're coming in and building communities. I'm saying there is no simple solution to that. We have to recognize the difficulties that Israel faces, the fact that they have a right to security, but at the same time, the Palestinians find themselves you know, a victim of these political kinds of forces. Um, I've had people say to me, people who were very much pro-Israel, particularly Christians who are very pro-Israel, because there's a large group of, of uh, evangelical fundamentalist Christians who are in support of Israel, and they'll say, yes, but God promised that land to the, to the Jews 3,500 years ago. They have a right to it. And I say, well, yeah, but <laughs> imagine for those of us who live in the United States, imagine one day you're at your home that you built and you love, and somebody knocks on the door, and it's a group of men. They're Native Americans. And they say, before your people were ever on this continent, this was our land, and we're taking it back. Would you leave? How would you respond to that? To a great extent, that's how the Palestinians feel. You know, they've been there for 1,500 years, maybe not 3,500, but long enough to feel like this is our place, and yet a lot of people act like they don't have a right to it. I believe the problem that we, we run into, oh, by the way, I'm going to show you this map. 
this is the, the international differences. The, the blue countries are the ones that recognize um, Israel and have some relations with Palestine, the light blue. The dark blue recognize only Israel and no acknowledgement of Palestine is being valid at all here and here. The uh, brown are those that recognize both Israel and Palestine as a nation. The green are the ones that recognize only uh, recognize Palestine and have some relations with Israel. And then the dark green, the light, that's the light green, the dark green are the ones that recognize only Palestine and not Israel. And it is not surprising that the blue countries and the green countries tend to not get along. So there is a widely diverse perception of this globally. As I say, just over 120 countries have recognized the right of Palestine to exist as a country. They consider them a country, not an occupied territory like the United States does. I believe one of the problems is everyone keeps talking about finding a solution to the problem in Israel and Palestine. And it's it, particularly when you have presidents or prime ministers or political leaders, they want a legacy. They want to know that in their term of office, they solve the problem nobody else could solve. And they're all wanting to find a solution. I don't know that, that we can go from where we are to a solution. The one state solution is not going to work. Israel will not agree to that. The two state solution creates all kinds of other problems and how they set that up. I think instead of a solution, we need to be focusing our energies on just trying to get an improvement in the situation. Um, unfortunately, a year ago, uh, and I don't even know how this ended up. I need to look this up. Israel had a movement in the Knesset, the parliament in Israel, to actually reduce the number of representatives in the Knesset from the Palestinian communities. In other words, give less of a voice to the people, the Palestinians. And again, I don't know how that ended up, finally. I, should, I have to look that up. I believe one of the ways that Israel, the, the, those who have the strength, and Israel definitely has the power. Their military, you know, they're much more sophisticated. Their military is much more powerful. I believe that Israel, as has happened under Menachem Begin, uh, Ehud Barak, was one of one of the ones who was most willing to make compromise. But um, you know, people have been assassinated in both Israel and in Arab countries for saying they're willing to make concessions in order to have peace. But I believe that if Israel were willing not to give away the vote, not they would they would immediately be voted out of existence. But to take steps to give more of a voice. Not enough of a voice that they're going to be destroyed, but more of a voice, not less, as they were trying to do last year, but more independence. Perhaps what they want to work toward is not trying to create an, a second state, but maybe have an unincorporated territory. And that the independence of the West Bank, particularly Gaza, is a completely different monster. I mean, the ideal would be if they could have Egypt take that over, but Egypt doesn't really want them either because of the, the fairly radical Islamic element there. But the fact that they're so separated, they have two different parties governing them. Those parties don't like each other. They don't get along. They actually, last year, they came up in 2014, they came up finally with a compromise agreement between Hamas and Fatah. Well, we're still waiting to see how that's going to work out. Um, but if they could find a way, if Israel could find a way without threatening their existence to give more of a voice to the Palestinian people, that might start so that they begin to build more goodwill rather than... There was a time when nobody could imagine Egypt and Israel being having a peace treaty, or Jordan and Israel. And they all get along quite well right now. And so, and it begins, it has to begin, and so I believe that's the approach to it. Uh, the three kinds of, and, and one thing by the way that I think that the West could do to help is stop selling arms to everybody who wants to buy them. Oh, yeah. We, um, our, the United States aid package to Israel is equal to all the rest of the aid we give everybody else. It's quite extraordinary. And the vast majority of that is in military aid. As long as we keep selling everybody on both sides as many weapons as they want, we are not going to find a resolution of this problem. And I think we can't just say we're not going to sell arms to anybody anymore because that would create a war. But I think we need to pay, maybe have a, a program where we start stepping back. And I'm talking about on both sides, both Israel and the Arab countries, where we start, the United States takes a lead in starting to reduce the amount of weaponry that we provide there. Um, so I, I talked earlier about the fact that there are three major areas of conflict, Islam and the West. 
My feeling is that if we in the West can learn to respect and support without trying to dictate terms in this part of the world, then we will go a long way. We still have a tendency to want to control things. When Carolyn fell and hurt her elbow in Dubai, we went to a local hospital, which was the Iranian Red Crescent Hospital. Had a great doctor there, it's a great hospital. He found out we were from the United States and he, his first comment, which was kind of political and later he's making all sorts of ISIS jokes, kind of weird. You know, he kept telling us that the assistant that was helping him stitch her up said, oh yeah, he's a terrorist. He's a member of ISIS. He helps me stitch people up during the weekend. On the weekends, he cuts off people's heads. <laughs> I think that comes under the category of gallows humor. But um, he said, his initial response was, he said, you know, we have a lot of trouble with our, country, our government in Iran, and they have a lot of problems. He said, and your country is not very respectful. That's all he said. But that's the attitude of a lot of people in this part of the world is, you know, you keep coming in here trying to tell us how to, how to run things. You've been doing that for centuries. You've been, you told us where the, where the national lines are, where the countries are divided. Um, if we can find a way to respect, support, without feeling as though we know best and we're going to dictate the terms of those folks, then we'll be much better off. I think the second kind of conflict between Islam and Islam of various kinds, we need to stay out of that as much as we can. Understanding that we, you know, who doesn't have a vested interest in stopping ISIL from what they're doing? But Syria and Iraq and Jordan and you know very all, a lot of other countries, they're more concerned about that than we are. That's their backyard, and they don't they they dislike it more than we do. And so, while we can be supportive of our allies in the region to try to solve those problems, ISIL, Yemen, etc., we need to be very careful before we step in. And I'll give you a good example of that. After 9/11, the United States, we were everybody on the planet, every other country on the planet was sympathetic to us. You know, the, the organizations like Al-Qaeda, they were cheering, but they don't represent any governments. The governments, the Islamic governments of the world, were sympathetic to us as well. And our response was to send an army into Afghanistan and then later to Iraq, two countries that actually had nothing to do with 9-11. The people who committed the, the crimes in 9-11 were Saudis, but the Saudis are our allies. So we go into Afghanistan and go after the Taliban, which technically did not have, Al-Qaeda had a presence there, but technically that didn't have anything to do with 9-11. And then Iraq, which again, there were problems there, and there was concern about weapons of mass destruction and all that. But the Islamic world, the Arabic world, looked at that and said, what is wrong with you? We've now got an imperialistic Western army on our soil. And all of a sudden, we went from being, having sympathy and actually support from these countries to being the enemy again. We completely lost that opportunity. And I'm not saying that politically. I'm not picking on anybody, George W. Bush or anybody else. I'm just saying that look at the history of it. That was a really bad idea. And we need to not repeat those kinds of things. And then the third, Israel and Palestine. As I say, I don't think we're going to find one solution real quick. And, and just so somebody can put it on their resume, we're not going to go from zero to solution immediately. We need to find baby steps. We need to find ways that we can try to encourage a movement forward by the people involved there. Um, and we need to call it honestly. We need when, when one side or the other is doing something that's inappropriate or oppressive, we need to be willing to say that, whether they are Palestinians or other Arab countries or Israel. We need to be much more, the, the, the West, and I don't just mean the United States, but all of the countries of the West need to be much more open about saying that's not right. You know, we can't treat people that way. That's not the way we ought to be acting in a civilized world. Uh, and we have a tendency not to want to do that, especially with our allies. There's a bazillion other things I can say, and you know, um, I had hoped they wouldn't provide anything you guys could throw, um, you know, bowls and stuff. But <laughs> any questions about any of that or comments? I'll entertain comments as well. You know, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Am I in favor of Iran getting nuclear weapons? I'm not in favor of anybody getting nuclear weapons. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, me too. Yeah, we don't get to say it and not Well, the issue of Iran having nuclear weapons, as I say, at what point do we, you know, at what point do we say we've gone as far as we can in trying to prevent a country from being self-self-governing? And I, I'm not, I'm not saying we shouldn't. I am not a pacifist. 
I believe there are times when military intervention is necessary, and even military intervention by the United States and other places. But we need to be very cautious before we do that. And I think that we're better better advised to support the people in, in, the re, in that region in some way, rather than assume that we do it ourselves, simply because the fallout from that can be so extraordinary. Again, I'm not, I'm not picking sides, and I'm not saying I'm a pacifist. I'm just saying we have not had a very good history in terms of our judgment calls on those kinds of things. So we need to be a little more cautious about that. I, I actually am inclined to believe that the issue of, you know, um, President Obama is trying to create a an arms deal on the one hand, in other words, have a relationship with Iran, but on the other hand, being very clear that we don't support what they're doing in, in supporting the, the uh, healthy Shia rebels in Yemen. Okay, that's a real hard dance. And by the way, I'm not a politician. I'm going to get a whole series of t-shirts that say, I'm not an Egyptologist. I'm not an ornithologist. People have asked me what birds were that they saw. I'm not a petrochemical engineer. I'm not a geologist. And I'm not a political scientist. Um, my perspective, perspective on this is historical and cultural and religious. Understanding those factors are often the underlying factors behind political stuff. But I don't consider myself any authority in political, uh, political evaluations. So that's why I'm very clear in saying this is entirely my subjective kind of view, looking at it historically and culturally, and understanding some of the religious differences. Yes? Just a com comment and ask you a question. If you look at the chart that you showed us that had the, the settlements in the West Bank. That one? Right. And, and, then you, and then you think about how do we come up with a scheme that gives a little more authority to the Arabs without, or the Palestinians, without them a single state solution. I, I, I think about that and then I think about this and I think how, how can you do it, mm -hmm. right? You've got these people, you know, on each other's land, uh, right. you know, you can't even draw a boundary line hardly. If you take the fences down, which you make a powerful argument, maybe you should, but then you've had the Infada, you know, multiple right. times. You know, if, if, have you got any more thought, any more depth well, of thought on how that could work? The, Israel has, has proven twice in the past that they are not reluctant to take settlers and force them to leave. There were, um, there were Jewish settlers in the Sinai. And in order to pursue the agreement between Menachem Begin and, and Anwar Sadat, they forced those settlers to move back into Israel and out of the Sinai Peninsula. They forced um, the Israelis who were living in the Gaza Strip, there were not as many of those, to leave the Gaza Strip and move back into Israel. So they've done that before. There are a lot more people involved in this, and so most people who look at this say the thing that Israel would need to do is to agree that the heaviest populated of these areas, they're going to make that part of Israel, and in return for that, give land of equal quality. And see, that's one of the problems in this part of the world, is not all land is equal. You can't say, oh, I'm going to take this 100 acres and give you that 100 acres. If this 100 acres has water and is arable, and that 100 acres is all sand and rock, all right, so there's a, there are more complicated factors. But others, not just me, others have said that in order to make any sort of division work, Israel would need to redraw the boundary line, the green line as it's called, to move some of those settlements into land that's now considered Israel and other areas to, to trade that for, for arable land or decent land in other places. Um, again, how hard is that? It's almost impossible. But you know, one of the things about Israel is they've proven through their history that they can do the impossible. Um, yeah. the, you know, the Jewish people in Israel, they have taken the Hebrew language, which is a dead language, and did what no linguist thought they could do, and that is revive it into a live language. They have irrigated the Negev Desert and are growing plants in one of the most inhospitable places in the world. Um, it's so many things for both sides, for, for Israel and for the Palestinians. Much of it is just deciding. You know, I mean, that's true with almost anything in life. I was talking to somebody about taking vacations like this. You know, so many people say, oh, I could never do that. Well, the first thing you have to do is decide you're going to do it. And then you'll find a way to do it. And there have been some leaders in, in Israel, as well as in the Palestine, among the Palestinians, who have been prepared to make concessions to find peace. At what point does it become so painful to keep trying to do it this way that we're prepared to do almost anything? And I think, I think we're there. Yes? Why do you believe the, the Arab nation Palestinians into their country, uh, and you 
believe that it's been done as a political uh, ploy to uh, draw the Palestinians as this poor people being kept in refugee camps. <laughs> Yeah, so the question was, why is it that the other Arab nations have not been more ready to assimilate Palestinian refugees? And is it perhaps because that allows them to continue to see, I'm, I'm changing your words a little bit, but that allows them to continue to see the Palestinian problem uh, as a problem that they can focus on. Is that fair? Okay. That they use it at the, at, as long as they're in, they're in camps, they draw the sympathy because exactly. they're refugees in camps. Right, they can draw sympathy to, to that problem, and in effect, therefore, it's an anti-Israel uh, kind of thing. Um, I, I'm, I don't doubt there's some of that. I mean, who knows the evil that lies in men's hearts? You know, if we let women run things, I don't even have a problem myself. But, um, the, that may be some of it. Um, it. It may also be that some of these countries, who are themselves not particularly stable or well, um, the number of refugees they have in some areas are so great that they don't want to take responsibility for them because it's an enormous drain off of the resources they have for their own citizens. Jordan, which has been one of the most generous, you know, our guide was talking about that on the bus, you know, that the number of refugees they have taken on board has been a huge economic drain on, on not only financially, but on all of the resources that they have. And so I think some of it is the countries are fearful if they've got 100,000 refugees, I think there's 120,000 refugees, I believe it is, if I remember right, in, in Lebanon. But they keep them in 12 camps. They're not allowed to assimilate into the culture or take jobs or use the medical care. I think some of the concern is if they say, okay, you can become Lebanese citizens. And I think, this is my opinion, I can't, somebody who's a government official in Lebanon would probably be very upset at me saying this. I think some of the concern is if they were if they were generous to those people, how many more refugees are going to show up tomorrow? Yeah. You know, and so the reluctance to assimilate or to welcome or whatever, and Jordan has been the most welcoming, but in some of the other countries, the reluctance is if they make a concession today, how many people are going to show up knocking on the door tomorrow or next week? And I think that's part of it. And some of it may be a desire to make this a continued sore, you know, as the, the union workers used to say, you know, rub the bruises raw. Keep, keep them uh, troubled yeah, by that. Good. One here and then there. You see Jordan as an example of a country that's accepting refugees, yet Jordan recognizing the, the, the fact that Palestinians are a disruptive group within their country, have clamped down and have expelled many of the Palestinians that were in Jordan because they were they were setting up a really hostile environment. Right. And and so when when we talk about the Israelis dealing with the Palestinians, their own Arab uh, neighbors or see them as a hostile environment. So <laughs> That's true. That, right there. What he's saying is that some of the some of the Palestinians uh, refugees in Jordan were seen as host, as a hostile presence, and that they expelled them. Specifically, they expelled Hezbollah. You know, they drove them out of the country because Hezbollah was again a military militant force. They didn't do a sweeping kind of all the Palestinians have to leave. They specifically drove Hezbollah out. They went into Lebanon, and that ended up being the source of not only more conflicts for Israel in the north but um, the Lebanese civil war and so and, and atrocities and refugee camps and all kinds of things. So again, it's way complicated, but yes? How do you define a Palestinian? Uh, a Palestinian is someone who traditionally is a citizen of this land of Palestine, that is before the influx of the Jewish people. They are particularly Arabic and, by, and predominantly uh, Islamic, but most people don't know this, the largest Christian group in this part of the world are Palestinians. At one point, almost 20% of all Palestinians were Christians. Because of all the problems, the, the Christian Palestinians tended to be more well off, and a lot of them left. But people who associate Palestinian with uh, Muslim, it, that's more true today simply because of attrition, but that, that has not been historically the case. We're talking generations, and we're not talking about people that ever lived in Palestine. What's that? I'm sorry? We're 
we're not talking about the majority of the people who never live in Palestine that we're calling Palestinian right now. Uh, so you're saying that you, yeah, they, if I heard you... gone so long that the third, fourth, fifth generation... Right, well, the largest population of them are still here, are still in the West Bank. Some of them are across the borders. Some of them have been assimilated in other countries. They've traveled elsewhere, you know, to the West or whatever. But they have lived there. I mean, for the last 1,500 years, their ancestors have been present in this place. So the fact that they haven't been there since, some of them, they haven't been back in Palestine since the 1940s, they're still waiting. They still consider this their home. Uh, and so we are talking about Arabic peoples who have a history of living in Palestine, as it was called. Is there another hand over here? Okay, yes. Uh, what's like your opinion on why 9-11? Why did 9-11 happen? <laughs> because people are evil. <laughs> Most of the terrorist acts that occur are acts of evil. They're expressions of insecurity and of needing somebody else to blame. The thing I was talking about earlier. We never want to say that our situation is our responsibility or the responsibility of our group. It's something someone else has done to us. And that's why the West, I mean, some of the reasons I was talking about the difficulties, the strains between the West and Islamic powers, they want somebody else to blame. And they want to find ways to lash out at those people they then lay blame on. And it is because of their own insecurity. I mean, Os Osama bin Laden was wealthy. I mean, he's rich. He came from a wealthy family, and yet there was an insecurity there over what had happened to the Islamic people. He blamed the West for that, the great Satan, and so he led others to commit that act, those acts of violence. I think they are, myself, expressions of evil, which I think is a very real thing. Um, evil expressed through people's insecurities, their desire to lash out, their desire to blame somebody else, and then take revenge for that. I don't think there's a better explanation for that. Yes? Correct me if I'm wrong, but it's my understanding that the Protestant Church of the United States of America has taken a position supporting divestment of um, investment. Right, the BDS. So, would you comment? On yeah, um, Arnie's question is Is it true that the Protestant Church in the United States has taken a stand in favor of? Actually, that's not true because the Protestant Church is not one thing. There are many different groups within Protestantism, um, and you know, I'm a Presbyterian, there are Methodists, there are Baptists, there are Anglicans, there are Pentecostals, etc. There are some groups that have, I think the UP, uh, PCUSA, Presbyterian Church USA, I believe they have come out, at least tacitly, in favor of divestment in Israel. I'm sorry, They're, I meant the Presbyterian. What's that? Oh. I meant the Presbyterian. Yeah, and uh, even that, there's different Presbyterian churches. There's Presbyterian Church USA, uh, Cumberland Presbyterians, Presbyterian Church of America, we represent. We are our own denomination in Mexico for various reasons. We we couldn't be part of another Presbyterian body, uh, and and we would not support that. I'm speaking as a pastor there, and so I know that there are, there are Presbyterian bodies and other Protestant bodies who would not support divestment. And in fact, um, most of those bodies have not made any formal organizational kind of statement. People will vi will differ within within that, and so they don't take a formal stand. A few denominations have made statements about that, but they're not in any way compelling. They don't require that. So, okay, we've gone. I'll take one more question. If anybody has a hot one, yes, Pitt. Philosophically, could it be that uh, to think back to the Florence of Arabia and and the Arabs focused as brotherhood against the Turks in World War One, and the Arab Council, as soon as you lost the common enemy, they began to bicker within one another. Could there be a role here where the Arab world is focused on not accepting the Palestinians because it keeps multiple cultural organizations focus on a common issue and therefore they maybe don't fight with each other? Yeah, uh, I think if you all didn't hear him, he said, is it possible that by having a common enemy, that is the Israel or the West or whatever, they, that the Arab peoples find unity in that, and um, whereas otherwise they're very tribal and they, they have disagreements? Well, um, I was head resident of a college dorm once, and the dean who's responsible for that, we were talking about building, you know, like, unity, esprit de corps, whatever, within the dorm. And she said, always remember, there's two ways to get people pulling together. Either have something you're all in favor of or have something you're all against. <laughs> and so there is always some aspect of that in human nature. And the, the ideal, the best, is to have both. I mean, if you really want to get people uh, 
pulling together. There may be some of that, that, that having a common enemy of any kind, for any group of people, not, the, not just the Arabs or the people in the Islamic world, having a common enemy is always you know, something that draws people together. I mean, what happened after the bombing of Pearl Harbor? You know, massive unity in terms of patriotism and a desire to recognize we have this enemy, we all have to get together. And you know, you gather up stuff in the, in the Second World War, you know, gathering up rubber and all kinds of, so yeah, that happens in any group of people, and I'm, I don't doubt that there's probably some of that. Okay, thank you all very much. I appreciate you listening. I'll talk to you tomorrow.